us tech journalists, we write about um, tech and how it's affecting our lives every day. Mm. But how many times do we come across research or anything impactful about climate and AI? The impact it has on climate, we barely speak about it. And one of the major reasons is because the research that is being done is at a very minuscule level. The recent report by Hugging Face, in which uh, they did in collaboration with a university, that mentions that if you generate an image on an AI model, it uses as much energy as you using your phone. Hmm. I mean, and we have been using these models all around the year. We, you and I, we, have been, we use it, I think, on, on a daily basis. And ChatGPT now itself has like somewhat 10 million daily users, 100 hmm. million. Weekly. 100 million, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, we can't even fathom the amount of times it's being used and the impact it has. But there is also positives in um, climate and AI, where uh, AI as a tool is being used in multiple sectors mm. um, to enhance or make the process more efficient, like for example in agriculture mm. or uh, green energy, for example, better cooling methods mm. uh, that companies are using for their data centers. Mm. So uh, that is one of the positives of using AI in climate, I suppose. What do you think about that? So there is a lot of work happening at the intersection of these two hmm. subjects. There is the uh, climate change AI, hmm. which uh, I think wrote a, wrote a paper some four to five years ago that said uh, tack tackling uh, climate change with machine learning. Hmm. And it's been less than five years and we've already shifted the entire conversation from now AI to everyone's just speaking about generative AI. Right. So how does one move forward so quickly hmm. without taking a step back and then understanding the impacts of this. I think they did try to take a step back, but that failed miserably when Elon Musk and everybody said, let's take a six month break from huh. AI and just, you know, completely ignored it and released Grok, another exactly. model which probably uses more energy. Yes, so it's very difficult to look at the positive picture, hmm. but then there are again researchers who are working. So for example, so now one of the researchers that I recently spoke to, she said um, in terms of wildlife conservation, they have an, a very basic AI model that's helping them uh, identify different species of animals, animals. and insects, right. which if done manually hmm. takes a lot more time hmm. when in, in, like in contrary to when done with an AI model. Right. So that's one of the instances where it's being used. So um, even though there are some positives, I feel like unless companies take the stand hmm. to um, be more transparent on how much they are emitting to admit to the problem so that we can take the next step in so solving it, hmm. it is sort of a moot point. You yeah, know? so companies need to do that. And like one of the steps that we saw very recently was uh, NeurIPS, hmm. the Neural Net Conference. Yeah. Uh, I held its uh, 37th edition, I think, two two weeks ago. Okay. And uh, re -re they recently revamped their code of ethics, hmm. which said that now the companies that have to submit their research papers, hmm. they need to disclose a certain amount of information regarding the carbon footprint and the emissions without right. which their papers will be rejected. Right. So, I mean, that should be made more mandatory for papers on ArcSive or other yeah. platforms. If research is being done, hmm. why not also follow how much carbon is being used exactly. and em energy is being used and carbon emitted. There was an interview with Ilya and uh, Sam Altman in Israel a year ago where he spoke about carbon capture hmm. and how AI is going to help um, find a solution towards carbon capture mm -hmm. and how we can significantly reduce the amount of carbon dioxide. <laughs> but it doesn't, I mean, um, even researchers are very, very skeptical about yeah. this. And there was something about like putting a shield between yes. the sun and the earth. And yes, well, a know. huge umbrella in between so that we'll, ha we'll dim down the sun yeah. apparently. See, again, which, that is all secondary, right? Like these yeah. projects that we come across, yeah. the, the companies say that, oh, we're doing this, we're going to do that in the next decade or in the next 50 years. But that's a secondary thing compared to the impact, the models that we're using right now on daily basis that's having. Because even in terms of regulation, I mean, the Security Exchange Commission in certain countries, yeah. they have made it mandatory hmm. for the uh, for companies to reveal the these information. Hmm. But I mean, the companies are not adhering to these laws. Well, I think the next step, the fines will be levied on them and then 
instead of paying up they will probably say yeah, okay here not, is the like, the problem is that there are several tools one hmm. of which is code carbon hmm. i think it's been downloaded some over 3 lakh times up until okay. now yeah so th- this tool basically helps you understand that if you're running a certain model on your pc how much um, emission is happening hmm. via that specific model on that specific computer right. or the device right so basically in conclusion if companies need to be more transparent there is work being done by ai researchers also at the grassroots level neurips for example and um, going forth if the companies themselves are not transparent enough the users themselves need to figure something out and one of the major uh, role will be played by open source over here because even the yeah. hugging face um, yeah re- report that we saw hmm. about uh, generative ai models and how much emissions they make it came out of hugging face yeah itself. so at the end open source is doing way more for the community than companies are